Father, thank Thee for this evening. Thank Thee that we before Thee can bow as Thy people in adoration, in worship, in gratitude for salvation through the blood of Christ. Thank Thee, Father, for our Savior, Thy Son, Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us unto himself a people, washed in the blood that he shed on Calvary, the blood of God, God the Son. And so we bless thee for our wonderful Redeemer and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We bless thee for the Holy Spirit, who shall not speak of himself, <coughs> but his whole work is to glorify Christ. We bless Thee for the Holy Scriptures and the centrality of the Scriptures from the beginning verses of the Bible point to Jesus, to the last verses. Everything centers on Christ and to the degree we are Christ-centered in our worship, in our doctrine, to that degree we are safe and biblical. And so God, come therefore now by Thy mercy through the Holy Spirit to glorify Thy Son Jesus for the extension of his kingdom in our hearts, in our lives. Come visit us. Fill me now with the Holy Spirit and speak, God, in thine own way to every heart. In Jesus the Christ's holy name, amen. In John 16, verse 8, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And Christ said these words, When he is come, that is the Holy Spirit, when he is come, he will convince, he will reprove the world of sin. and of righteousness and of judgment. When he is come, he will, God said, reprove. That word means convict. He will convict the world of sin. Of righteousness and of judgment. D. L. Moody, one of the greatest soul winners in the history of the church, he said these words, if the first work of the Holy Spirit that you claim is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, is not to have convicted you of sin, then nothing you claim is the work of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The first work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life is to convict that person of sin. And if that is not the first work that you've experienced or claim, was the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, then nothing you claim is the work of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. It has to be. How can you come to God as a sinner unless you know you're a sinner? How can you cry to be saved as you come confessing your state to God for salvation if you have nothing to be saved from? His first work, even a child, don't doubt this, is to know they come as a sinner. The first work of God the Holy Ghost is to reprove, to convict the world of sin. 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess 
our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. If we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. We call him God a liar. For God has said, all have sinned. All have sinned. Romans 3 verse 23. There is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3 verse 10. All your righteousness is as filth. Terrifying word. Isaiah 64 verse 6. All your righteousness is as filthy rags in my sight. In Luke 18 verse 10, Jesus tells the story of two men. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee, a deeply religious man. He dressed religiously. He was in every meeting. His whole life unashamedly was sold out and separated for the religion of God's ordained religion on earth. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, deeply religious. And the other, a publican. Very irreligious to be a publican. Godless. Despised by the religious. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Exhausted, unjust, adulterous, or even as this publican. I fast. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, God be merciful to me. God be merciful to me. A sinner, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Here were two men in the house of God, in the ordained religion of God. They went to pray. The one couldn't put himself into the category of a sinner. He's religious. He couldn't come to a point in life where he could put himself in. He was raised in religion. I'm not as other men are. He names a sinner as a publican. And he gives all the reasons of his righteous upbringing and his religious life. And the other man comes as a sinner, literally the sinner. He didn't look at anybody else to hide behind, to justify himself as to say, I'm not in that wickedness. And a beloved, you come to God as a sinner. And even if you're raised in religion, unless you've come to God as a sinner, broken by your sin, you will never, ever be justified. You can be born in a church. You can die in the same church. You can dress religiously. You can have the chief seats. You can be seen miles away by your dress code that you're separated totally to religion, unashamed by the way you dress like these Pharisees. You saw them. But you can go straight to hell unless you come to a place that you realize there's nothing. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Until that prayer, God can't look at you. He'll send you straight to hell with all your religion. You have to come as a sinner no matter who you are. You have to know when the Holy Spirit's work is to convict the world of sin. When he has come, 
He will convict, he will reprove, he will convict the world of sin. And secondly, of righteousness. When he has come, he will convict the world of righteousness. Be not deceived. No unrighteous person shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a staggering statement. Nor that defiler shall enter therein. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Be not deceived. No unrighteous person shall enter the kingdom of heaven. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God now commandeth all men. I love that. If I didn't believe that, I'd stop preaching. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Who will have all men to be saved. I love that. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. I believe that and I preach that. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repent ye therefore and be ye converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be ye converted that your sins may be blotted out. Your sins can't be blotted out unless you repent from them. Amen. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh his sins, the same shall have mercy. I don't see anything else taught in this book. Righteousness. Romans 6 verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servant ye are. To whom ye obey. I want to repeat that. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are. To whom ye obey, whether of sin, whether of obedience unto righteousness, or sin unto death. Staggering words. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful for the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith. And I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there's one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Worthless. Literally worthless. Oh, beloved, be careful here. Be careful here. Be not deceived. No unrighteous person shall enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves of mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, Revilers, exhaustionists shall inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified. Whether the washing is there, but the sanctifying is there also, hand in hand, justified. You're separated. You're set free. John 8, verse 34 tells us, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You're enslaved to sin, literally. You say you're not, you try stopping, and then argue with me. And then God says in verse 38, But if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Oh, beloved, there has to be not righteousness imputed, but righteousness imparted in this book. Righteousness imputed is by grace through faith in one moment. 
in the shed blood, you're made righteous in God's eyes through an act of faith in Christ's death. But this is speaking in its context to anyone who has a clear mind of righteousness imparted. God sets you free. Be not deceived. No unrighteous person shall enter the kingdom of heaven. He will convict the world of sin, firstly. Secondly, he will convict the world of righteousness. And finally, he will convict the world of judgment. If you don't come to God as a sinner and seek him, not just for the salvation of your soul because of sin, but the deliverance, God's deliverance from a life of sin, enslavement to sin, and righteousness is imparted where all things are passed away, all things become new. Beloved, you're in trouble. You will face judgment. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and finally of judgment. Of judgment. Terrifying words, this. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now, if you don't preach that, leave the pulpit. For men's blood will be on your hands. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Revelation 20 verse 11. John records the revelation given to him by Jesus of mankind's destination. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, I saw the dead small and great stand before God, children and grown-ups. I saw the dead small and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, let me tell you something. That word means there's no mercy. If you have not prepared to meet with God, God's way, before you die, there's no mercy. Those hands that for all eternity will have the marks to bear witness that he tasted death for every man, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth, who gave himself a ransom for all, who commands all men everywhere, and he has no right to, to repent. He had no right to if he didn't die for all men. Oh, beloved, those hands that for all eternity, Revelation tells us, will bear the marks, witnessing that he tasted death for every man. And then God says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. If you have not prepared to meet with that God before you die, it is a fearful thing, even a child, because small and great, not just grown up, not just old, small, will stand before God, who played the fool with eternity, knowing they're sinners, but would not come as sinners, and would not repent and turn and seek God for deliverance, for salvation, not from hell, but from sin, and then that will save them from, from an enslavement to sin, that is. Oh, be careful. Be careful. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Though those hands bear the marks that he died for you, there's no mercy for all eternity. Cast! Whoso was not found written in the book of life, whoso was not found having turned and sought God desperately, his way, was cast, there's no mercy in that word, into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death where the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. They have no peace day or night. Don't doubt that. The place prepared for the devil and his angels and all those whose names are not written in the book of life. Oh, you'll be there with Satan and demons. In the same torment, he will have no greater torment than you, sir. You'll be in the same place for eternity.
2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, He will return in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will return in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power. A man once cried out desperately to Paul, What must I do? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Paul looked at him and cried back, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Not of works. It is the gift of God. To him that worketh not but believeth, on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted to him for righteousness, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith in one moment, God declares you righteous because of your faith in the shed blood of Christ. By faith, being justified freely by grace through faith in his death. Being justified freely by grace through faith in his death. Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He paid the penalty for the suffering you deserve for all eternity so. And he did that somehow. It's beyond human comprehension how God placed on him the entire world's sin and suffering that would have known for all eternity. He died for you. He suffered for you. You won't have to suffer one iota for any sin you've ever, con ever committed if you come to God through Christ. You see, salvation is through Jesus Christ. He will in no wise turn away anyone who comes to him through Christ. He can't. That's something God can't do. Why? Because he tasted death for every man who will have all men to be saved. And God promises he will in no wise turn away anyone. John Wesley's famous statement, he cannot in righteousness turn away anyone who comes with the blood of Jesus, who comes with nothing but the blood he will not turn you away. He cannot. He's righteous, he's holy, he's just. And of course his Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit as we spoke the first night that you are the children of God. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. You don't live in fear. There's no condemnation to them which in Christ Jesus. There's no, we know we've passed from death unto life. He that believeth on the, on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. I believe that with all my heart. God gives you peace, peace with God, peace that passes all understanding. Death has lost its sting. The last enemy is there, is death. It is an enemy. But no fear of judgment. It's not easy to face the sufferings, the frailty of old age. But there's no thought of judgment. There's a conviction, a convincing of the work of the Holy Spirit as he bears witness in your heart, in your spirit, in your conscience that takes away any fear of judgment. You know. You've passed from death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that death is speaking about eternal death, not just physical death. It started the, because of Adam on physical death, but in its context, the wages of sin, the just reward of unrepentant sin, once you've heard the gospel in its context, is eternal suffering and damnation, separated, called death. But there's a second death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus, through faith in his death, through faith in his resurrected life. For as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Even if they may believe on his name. We have this treasure in earth and vessels of the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. Christ in you is the hope of glory. You have no hope of eternal life in this crisis in you. And your faith not only in the death of Christ, but in the living Savior. To set you free. You can't be saved just looking at a death. 
You have to come to God looking at his life to set you free. For if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free. Oh, God lied. And that's blasphemous to believe such a thing. He cannot. If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free. You who are enslaved to sin. Oh, there's judgment. He will convince the world of sin. He will convict the world of righteousness. Be not deceived. No unrighteous person shall enter the kingdom of God. And then he names the sins. The theologians today say God made a mistake. Let's tear these things out of the Bible. Those sins won't be condemned. Rubbish. You will face God in terror, you people that preach that from the pulpit. I guarantee you, and in one moment, because that's all you've got, this moment of cold life, you will face God in terror for denying what God condemns and condoning it. No, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. That is his work. And then he will give you such peace that passes all understanding as he bears witness of your spirit that you are truly born of God, saved. There's no condemnation. The work of God, the Holy Ghost, according to Christ. He will convict the world of sin. My darling mother. I had a remarkable mother. Even yesterday... I said to the Lord from my soul, I thank thee, God, that you gave me that mother, that she was my mother. I thanked him from my soul after all the years, now she's gone. My mommy. Oh, when we were saved, by the way, I wasn't just a little boy, I was 20 years old. And I came to Christ so broken. But God, as I stood up, had saved me in my brokenness, enslaved, destroyed, shamed, disgraced. He saved me. He saved my father, my brother, three years older than me, mightily saved us. Then there was my mommy. She was the only unsaved person left in the home. That's a terrible predicament to be, you know. (laughs) Mommy looked at me one night in the kitchen as I was talking to her. She said, listen, don't think I'm ignorant. Don't think I don't know what you're trying to do. You, your father, your brother, you believe I'm going to hell. You believe that God's going to judge me because I'm a sinner, that I have to repent. Listen carefully. I can understand why God would have sent you to hell, Keith, if you hadn't repented and changed like he has. I worship God for what he's done in your life. Don't believe I'm... I can understand why God would have sent your brother to hell. I can understand why God would send your father to hell the way he lived. But God has no right to send me to hell. I'm not a sinner, Keith. Your father gave up drinking all the alcohol, smashed the bottles that he's been enslaved to and put us through hell on earth because of his addiction to sin, to all this drinking. He threw down his cigarette 60 a day for 27 years, never less than 66. He stopped all the things. He repented of the things that I can understand and you did and your brother did. But what do I repent of? What do I throw out, Keith? Tell me, give me name why God will send me to hell. Your mummy never touched alcohol in her life. Go to your father, he was my childhood sweetheart. Go to my brothers. I have never, I don't know what champagne tastes like. I don't know what wine tastes like. That some Christians justify. I don't know once in my life that I've even tasted, Keith. I just push it away at weddings as champagne. Push it away. No. I've never touched a cigarette in my entire life. Your daddy had to throw them away, it seemed, when he got saved. I've never touched a cigarette in my life. Keith, I've never been unfaithful to your father. I never thought I'd ever have to tell you, my boy, but 
I'm going to tell you now, men did try to get me, Keith. The world's so wicked. I never wanted to tell you, but I'm going to tell you now. Men came, tried, and I said to each one of them, get away from me, you filth! You filth! I'm a married woman. I never betrayed your father. Or you. Keith, you might have gone astray, which broke me and aged me. Point to me and tell mommy what she did to make you do that. I didn't do that, Keith. I didn't cause that. I tried to be, I tried to be a good, faithful wife. I tried to be a good, faithful mother in every aspect, no matter what sacrifice was required of me, I did for you from a baby right through. Where did I fail you as a mother, Keith? That God's going to judge me. You won't find dirty books in my home. What books do I throw out that are morally decadent? That I hear other Christians... You won't find things. I didn't stoop to the magazines and the things that are moral and common and undermine integrity and decency. No, you won't find anything in this home. My boy, what dirty language. I never told a dirty joke in my life. From a little girl right through the years, ask my brothers. They come here all. Ask your father. He knew me. He's my only sweetheart from childhood. I never knew another man, Keith. Listen, Keith, I never, ever listened to a dirt. But the moment I realized there's something of a question mark on a dirty joke, I said, stop. And I walked out, please, stop. I wouldn't stoop to listen to something of a filthy joke. I didn't use dirty language. Have you ever heard your mother swearing immoral words? Dirty words, Keith. I am not a sinner. What is God going to judge me? Tell me what to repent of. Tell me what to throw out. Tell me what to come to God as a sinner for. Don't you say God will send me to hell or judge me. He cannot. After the life I have pursued with all my heart to live in decency and integrity. I looked at my mother and you know I couldn't say a word. I was just saved. <laughs> And I stood there and literally worshipped God for the mother I had, as unsaved as she was, that I had been privileged to have. I just stood there in my heart worshipping God, looking at her. I didn't say a word. Oh, but God heard her. And within days there were missionaries, preachers coming into our home where she said the same thing. And Eileen Tauti, this godly woman, led thousands of people to Christ across Africa. This missionary comes into our home like many godly people came in our home. Mrs. Daniel, you're calling God a liar. And that's a sin. God says all have sinned. There's none righteous. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. You're calling God a liar, the Bible says. That's a terrible sin. You're saying, Mr. Daniel, that Jesus had to die for your husband to be saved. Jesus had to die for your children, but he didn't have to die for you. You were good enough. Mrs. Daniel, that is a terrifying sin. You're putting your fist up to God and say you lie because God says you're all sinners. There's none righteous. He tasted death for every man. Mrs. Daniel, you are a terrible, terrible sinner saying that, believing that. But you're good enough. You've got to, all your righteousness is filthy rag. All the verses I quoted tonight, she quoted to my mother. Oh. Mrs. Daniel, the Bible says, with all the wicked sins in Revelation, murdering every filthy sin, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. A little lie, Mrs. Daniel. In your whole life. You can't stand there and say that God lied, that you've never sinned, that you're not a sinner. You were born in sin, with a sinful nature. And sin was in your life. Now I don't know what God did, but I did know this. My mother suddenly went silent and sad and, and didn't want to speak. And we were concerned but she just withdrew. And then, one night in a meeting, 
My mother stood up and walked out. Now that cost my mother. If you knew her, if you just saw her, you'd know what that cost my mother. She walked out as a sinner. I don't know what God convicted her of or how. But she walked out with as much fear and consciousness and sorrow that she was a sinner as my father who had been an alcoholic. As me and my brother who had lived wildly in sin and shame. She had no less conviction that she was a sinner. She went out back behind the pulpit into some room with some woman, prayed. She comes out. I knew my mother was saved. Not because she threw bottles away, not because she changed all her magazines, not because she stopped swearing or suddenly became faithful or a good mother. Stops drinking, stops smoking, no, nothing. I saw her get rid of nothing. Nothing. But I knew she was saved because in her eyes I saw for the first time in my life peace that passes all understanding. And until you see it, you don't know what I'm speaking about. Until you experience it, you haven't got the slightest comprehension of God's peace. My peace give I unto you. Peace that passes all understanding. Peace with God. Oh, my mother had peace, and I knew she was saved because I'd never seen that in her eyes, not once in my life, until she walked out of that meeting, broken, tears, yes, but peace, the peace of God. And in her own unique, careful, dignified way, she would witness unashamedly of Christ and of what God had done to her husband and what God had done to her sons, unashamedly. He will convince the world of sin, no matter who you are. Even if you've never touched a cigarette in your life, you're going to hell. Even if you've never, ever betrayed your husband, you've been a good mother. You've never sworn a dirty word or listened to a dirty joke. You face the same hell as your husband who drank, as your children who went wild into sin, and on both ends fervently serving the devil. You face the same hell, the same judgment. Because sin in God's eyes is not like sin in our eyes. We see one sin is bigger than another. We see depravity. In God's eyes, sin is evil, no matter the smallest. There's something of the holiness of God that we'll never comprehend, that he looks upon sin in such a way that the Bible said he cannot comprehend, he can't even look upon it. Well, of course he sees it, but he doesn't want to even behold it. He's so holy. Be careful. He will convince the world of sin. Of righteousness. Oh, that was beautiful. And my brother, arrogant, self-centered, heavy drinking, smoking, successful, whoa, had businesses, early age of 20, 2, 23, rich, wealth, you can't believe. Successful in everyone. Oh, what a disaster he was. And one night he knelt before God as a sinner. Going to hell. He stood up, so he didn't. One week later, we saw a change. That night, he went straight to my father, who he hadn't spoken to for three months. In anger at my father that he blamed for every unhappiness in that home, including for me being destroyed. And he put his arms around my daddy and he wept and asked for forgiveness for judging my father. And said, Daddy, all you need is Jesus. And forgive me that I judged you. And blamed you for everything, Daddy. Oh, Daddy, I love you. My father wept so loudly, we thought, my mommy thought he was going to die. Because he never thought his son would ever forgive him. Or love him again. Or show kindness to him. He had given up that hope. Oh, God changes everything in one moment. Anything you think can't be undone is done, done in one moment. If you truly get saved, if you let God do the work he can do, oh, Dudley's life was smoking, drinking, swearing, arrogance. He just cared about everybody else and the humility that no person could do, just mind over matter, you know. When I saw my brother, it wasn't a message. I could have argued against messages on hell. 
I could have walked away from those and said fanatical, crazy people, Bible punch. But you can't. You can't argue with a life. And you know through and how could I close my heart to the beauty of what God made him? I thirsted for God's salvation, not hearing ever the gospel and truth, just a life. The outworking of a gospel through the life is as used as mightily by God as the preaching. You see, we men, we're known and read of all men. Just the outworking of the scriptures, we're like a letter written not of ink, but by the Spirit, known and read of all men. You can't be hid. They hear the gospel, they see the power of the gospel as mightily as if they're hearing the preaching of the gospel in a life. Oh, I began to hunger and thirst after God through a life. By the time he took me to church to hear the gospel, I wanted to run through before the measure and get saved (laughs) because of his life. Like Ruth and Naomi, just that life said, because of that life of her mother in law, thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. It's a life can make people. And that life of my brother, the righteousness that God worked, not just the righteousness imputed because of Christ's death, the righteousness imparted because of Christ's living life coming into your heart, receiving the power is given unto you. Christ in you, and he sets you free. He doesn't make you sinless perfectionists. Well, we don't even know is sin. Sin is to know to do good and to do it not. But as we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, continually cleanses us from sins committed in ignorance. That which is more light and more light keeps coming. God's blood just cleanses you once you come in the light that you've got with the light. Oh, the blood starts cleansing. And never cease to look to the blood. Because you're going to get more and more light. The path of the justice is a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after. You see, Paul knew he wasn't totally perfect. But there's a, a moment of where God and all the light you're given sees. And the blood cleanses, but he cleanses sins committed in ignorance. Like the Old Testament. Every single facet of every single sacrifice made, we need to understand sins that were committed in ignorance, a sacrifice. That tells us what the cross, the blood, cleanses sins committed in ignorance. Because we haven't got more light yet. We haven't got all the light. God doesn't switch a light that you've got all the light. But all the light you've got staggers the powers of hell, staggers your family. My daddy stood up saved. That staggered multitudes of people throughout Southern Africa. And multitudes turned, though he never preached once, turned to God desperately through his life. And we saw righteousness. He convinces the world, he convicts the world of sin and of righteousness. Be not as if no unrighteous person. What of the prophet? You say you have faith. The devil believes everything unswervingly. He doesn't have any doubt of every word in this book, including his coming judgment. That doesn't save him. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. But you're not saved unless your faith works. Unless you're saved, your faith brings your life to alliance with what God says will happen in salvation, your faith is as good as the devil's. It doesn't profit you anything if it didn't work. It isn't the result of salvation. The setting free, the new creation, righteousness imparted. And we saw that. He will convict the world of sin. And he did. Even to a woman like my mother. She came as a sinner or she would have gone to hell. And of righteousness. And we saw that in Dudley's life. We saw that in Daddy's life. And I hope in my life, and in my mother, and of judgment. Oh, how many preachers walk up to me and say, oh, stop this. You're living in this generation, you're something from out of the ark, man, preaching is judgment and hellfire. I said, well, then the work of the Holy Spirit, you say, isn't necessary. He's going to, if he comes, he's going to do this, see things. Convict the world of sin, of righteousness. If you don't repent from that sin and become right, seek God to make you righteous, you will face judgment. He will convict the world of judgment. 
And you're saying, no. Anybody that lets the Holy Spirit do his work in that aspect is wrong. Why do most people come to God? Through love? Yes. But I tell you, the love behind knowing there's judgment, but he, his love has paid for you not to face that judgment. But if you don't preach the judgment, I doubt that 99.999% of people who've been saved on earth would have ever been saved. God have mercy on you who say we cannot preach God's judgment. You fail to warn the wicked from the air of his way that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require thine hand. Or well, don't you believe those verses, preachers, today? When were you saved? When did you get convicted? I'm not talking about if you spoke in tongues. When was the first work the Holy Ghost would ever do in a human's life? It was, otherwise, nothing you can talk of was the Holy Ghost. When did you get so convicted of sin that you stood there and cried, not, I thank you, I'm not as other men are. I'm the sinner, God, give me mercy and break before God as a sinner. When did you come as a sinner? The first work of the Holy Spirit and of righteousness, when did that happen? That you turned from unrighteous living by the grace of God when he saved you. When? Did you become a new creature in Christ that everyone saw the righteousness of God in you? Imparted, not just imputed, by faith. When did you avoid God's eternal wrath and judgment that God says will be upon those who do not come as sinners and who do not seek him for his righteousness to set them free from that which he damns for eternity, though men condone it today? When did this happen to you? When did the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit? You did the three things. The three works of the Holy Spirit led you and saved your soul. And the witness of your spirit. When? When? Answer God. Or are you going to spend eternity in damnation? Or that book is not true if you are not going to.